you just sit in that silence for a bit? God, you are holy. We know you are here and present with us. Thank you that you invade this space. And thank you that our words are an offering that you receive and that you give us blessings and love. And these things we pray. Amen. Thanks to the worship team. Uh, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good, good. Uh, let me, uh, I want to direct your attention first uh, to, well, let me just say, my name is Efren. I'm one of the teaching pastors here. Rumor has it I was uh, hired on the roll of a die or something from last week, <laughs> but whatever. Uh, hello to those of you on live stream. Uh, I do want to point your attention to the screen uh, and show this slide of Interactio. So just to remind you guys, Interactio is something we provide translation in, in time. So at this service right now, we're providing Swahili and French, and then the next service will have um, Spanish. So, that, so just to keep that in mind for all of you here. Well, uh, I want to start with a question. How many of you in this room have been asked the question, who do you want to be like when you grow up? And just think for a moment of maybe like three people that come to mind. And as you're doing that, I want to show you the three people that come to mind for me. You'll see on the screen. <laughs> Why is everyone laughing? I, everyone laughs every time they see those photos. So you'll see one, uh, David Blaine, who's holding the deck of cards right there. He's known as a famous illusionist and endurance athlete. He does a lot of crazy stuff, but he's mostly known for his endurance athlete type things. He'll be underwater for like 10 minutes at a time. He swallows frogs. Um, he's pretty cool in my book. <laughs> then there's, uh, it's hard to pronounce sometimes his name, but his name's Buokau. Uh, do you want to say that with me? Buokau. Good job. That's Thai. Uh, so he's a famous Muay Thai uh, kickboxer champion. I don't know if you guys know this, but I uh, do Muay Thai kickboxing myself. So if you're like at least like 5'7", I can kick you in the head if I wanted to, but <laughs> won't do that. And then we have Ron Swanson, Parks and Rec director. Uh, is actually a fictional character, but I just love his style. So he's on there for, for me. Now, short of stating the obvious, um, even though I inspired to be like these people, uh, my inability to even shuffle cards or my risk-averse nature, my lack of championship belts, and also uh, my saxophone skills or any musical talent that I have, uh, suggests that I wasn't very successful. Uh, the reason for musical talent is Ron Swanson plays the saxophone. And Greta would tell you that I have no rhythm either, so... There's that. Um, now, uh, for a lot of us, even if it's not someone, we've all had this underlying desire to be a certain kind of person. But there always seems to be a gap between who we want to become and who we actually are. And my guess is that I am sort of alluding to a universal longing or even lament. Now, it's very hard to become that ideal person you might have in your mind. With the digital age, marketing, television, and businesses all trying to monetize our behavior, this is particularly relevant for a lot of us in this room. One of the primary reasons we are here is to become like Jesus. And, um, and because of the, uh, Jesus, who, deep, who loves deeply, is close to the poor, patient, compassionate, self-control, and walks in the power of the Spirit. Now again, our culture isn't exactly conducive to walk in the way of Jesus. In a world full of anxiety, hurry, violence, and distraction, we have committed to a life that will always go against the grain. And But for some of us, it may feel like we are losing the battle. And um, at each turn, there are forces working against us and an enemy behind it 
looking to create in us certain kinds of people. And the reality is we live in a world that is constantly writing the narrative script in our stories, but more importantly, shaping the people we are becoming. And for us here, there is also a gap between what we know and what we do, and probably more importantly, what we want. So how can we, as the people of God, structure our lives to actually become more like Jesus? What will it take to reorient our life toward its deepest desire? In short, an intentionality for our spirituality. So as we turn to our text this morning, we find ourselves with Jesus and the disciples in what's known as the farewell discourse. This title bears a weight of significance because it is Jesus' parting words before his death. And in the turmoil and impending incarceration and crucifixion, uh, Jesus, in his final days, animates a life of fruitfulness and loving union. Here, Jesus' teaching ignites our imaginations and stirs the heart for a new way to live, a way to live the life of God intended for us. Now we turn to one of Jesus' most famous teachings in John 15. So if you would, turn your Bibles there with me, uh, and I'll read from the screen. It'll be on the screen as well. John 15, verse 1. I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my... Sorry. All right, we did... Mike, Mike time. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is the word of the Lord. Now, Jesus speaking to an agrarian society beautifully captures this vision of discipleship, a way of living a life that guides and guards us toward our truest north. Each character seems to find their place in our formation, the people we are becoming, God as the vine dresser, Jesus as the vine, and uh, us as the branches. Thus, Jesus' invitation is to a new way of life that flows in the fruitful unity and in the inner change of love. This morning, we look to answer, what does it mean to remain, or the word I'll use more often is abide. Some of your translations may say that. What does it mean to abide, to be pruned, and to bear fruit? So first, abide. Dwelling in the space of love. First, is there a background to this vine imagery? Clearly, this is a nod to the rural context of the first century, but this image also has some theological significance. If you trace the Hebrew scriptures, you will find numerous passages referencing this fine imagery, and particularly in the wisdom and prophetic books. And in all those passages, the vine symbolizes Israel, the people of God. Yet, mostly in all of them, the references... uh, Israel is portrayed on this dark background of divine judgment for their failure to produce good fruit. 
It's in this reassessment of Israel's past where Jesus interjects himself in this analogy of the vine. In the opening verse, Jesus states, I am the true vine. And by it, Jesus implies two things. First, he himself is fulfilling the purpose that Israel failed to achieve. And second, Jesus also suggests a new way to live, a more promising way to bear fruit. And as, as the true vine, Jesus becomes the relational place, source, and life for us to bear fruit. Now, second, notice that out of all of these All of these 11 verses, the repeated command is to remain, it's to abide. And for a second, just notice the relational language of that. The language of abiding is that of a home, a dwelling, a habitation, where individuals are so intertwinedly connected in love with one another. The implication is that to become like Jesus, we must abide in his presence. And verses 9 through 10 also tell us that to abide in his presence is to abide in his love. And so let me address one of the problems in what Jesus is saying here. And that is, what does it mean that Jesus uses spatial language just weeks before he departs physically? Think about that. What does it mean that Jesus talks about remaining when he's actually leaving? It prompts for us here as contemporary readers to ask, what does it mean to abide in a person who's physically not present with us? If you look a couple verses before in John 14, 16 through 17, it says this, and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. So if the Holy Spirit is our guide and then later says that he lives in us, then how do we engage in order to abide? Well, early followers of Jesus took the word picture of the vine and the branches into its logical conclusion. For a vine to bear much fruit It needs a trellis. And you guys might be familiar with it. You've seen it all. We kind of live in wine country here in the Willamette Valley. You'll see a picture of just the main one to focus on is the bigger one. But if you don't know what a trellis is, a trellis is a support structure to lift a vine off the ground, index it toward the light to give it room to breathe and also to guide its growth. So what is the spiritual equivalent of a trellis? The ancient fathers and mothers and the spiritual, er, spiritual followers of the way would say a rule of life. Notice the singular, not the plural, rules, but a rule of life. And there are many definitions out there, but I think uh, my adversary or John Mark Homer would define it best. A rule of life is a schedule and set of practices and relational rhythms that create space for us to be with Jesus, become like him, and do as he did. Now, there are two groups in church history that actually pioneered this idea well for us. And they're known as the Desert Fathers and Mothers and the Monastic Monks. You'll see two pictures of of one. One is of the Benedictine Meal, uh, which is a monastic order. And then on the other, you'll see the Desert Fathers. And in the wake of the aftermath of Constantine's rule, he decided to make Christianity the religion of the state, meaning that everyone was to be uh, Christian because of the culture. And so in that time, they, there was sort of this concealed evil of nominal Christianity, mainly just uh, lacking in discipleship and following Jesus, but merely being Christian because it was popular. Sounds pretty similar to our culture even today. And so um, men and women decided to rebel against this spirit, and so they fled to the desert 
to find God in the struggle and practicing ascetic disciplines which focus on the deprivation of the appetite in order for the sake of cultivating the spiritual life. This included vigils, fasting, celibacy, poverty, and solitude. And then right after that came the monastic movement. Um, if you guys, anyone's ever been to the Abbey in Mount Angel, that's a Benedictine monastic order. And so they adapted the spirituality of the desert, forming and going back to the cities and the towns and forming communities around a structured rule of life, a way to live out their faith. And this included uh, kind of two types of practices, those that were contemplative and those that were active. And contemplative rhythms of prayer, silence and solitude, fasting, scripture, and then there were active rhythms which were meant to serve the community. These were of hospitality, service, and generosity. You see, these monasteries established a way of living um, that was scheduled and structured under daily, weekly, yearly rhythms based on the Christian view of time. Now, I'm sure there's so many questions you might be asking or you might not even care about church history, but that's okay, because I want you to capture what these saints teach us. Number one, life with God cannot be an add-on to your already existing life. It must be a new way to live. Abiding in Jesus is, means that he is our gravitational center by which we interpret everything we do. Number two, spiritual growth must dignify the whole person. Now think about this. You can't just uh, think your way into Christ's likeness. More information cannot do the trick. This means that abiding requires embodied practices that recalibrate and reform our hearts toward God. And number three, to be formed by Jesus, we need set apart time, space, and awareness. Abiding requires a structure, a schedule, a rule of life. So what does, does your life have the structure and space to abide in Jesus' love. Just to simplify that, do you have a trellis? This leads us to the second, prune, shaping to be people of love. Now, most scholars note the unusual choice of the Greek word kathere uh, for pruning. Root, root, rarely is this word ever used or defined as pruning. A more common way to translate this is actually to cleanse and to purify. And because of this, it becomes clear what kathere in, the, in this verse means. On some level, it's pruning is this idea of cleansing from sin, the undoing of sin. However, this word is also used earlier in a story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet in John 13, 10. And it's almost as if John is highlighting the intentional verbiage here, which provides a powerful image of, a, of what cleansing symbolized in the act of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. It's almost to illustrate the posture both of the son and of the father in their, our pruning. And now we focus on God the father, the vine dresser. As a heavenly gardener, the role of the father is twofold. He prunes every branch that does bear fruit and he cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. It may be to our surprise that every branch that is actually bearing fruit is pruned. And we know that this makes sense logically from a gardening perspective, but just even above the imagery, this sort of signals that discipleship and spirituality signals a painful process, an undoing, a cutting. This may lead us to a wrong conclusion that God is an indifferent gardener who purely arrives at the scene to discipline and cut away our sins. 
But notice Jesus' clarifying statement. It's so they will produce even more. And like a gardener, the Father is tenderly cultivating your life with the deepest care and with the deepest joy, guiding and shaping it into a person of love. Now, how many of you are gardeners in the room? Wow, there's barely any. <laughs> I see Corey over there. Yeah, Corey does a lot of gardening. Yeah. Um, okay, don't tell me I'm wrong when I say all this stuff. Tell me later, maybe. So, or email me. Um, okay, so I'm no gardener, and I uh, don't know so much about what it takes, but what I do know is that pruning is actually very important. You see, without pruning, a vine may, ha- may outgrow its ability to sustain itself. It may overpower the other vines, uh, wreaking havoc in your garden. And what's unique about pruning is that on the surface, a vine may seem to be actually thriving, but in order for it to flourish, it must be pruned so that it can produce more fruit for the following season. And in all this, there is a sense in which pruning kind of takes on these two forms, controlled and uncontrolled pruning. Our rule of life, or our trellis, is our best attempt to participate in this pruning process in the disciplines of Jesus. Then there's a part where we have to release control, where to allow the vine dresser to shape and to work in this long obedience in the same direction. Now, if you see that photo, you may look at the shears and even the the act of cutting as this violent act, but in many ways, it's the most loving thing that a vine dresser can do. It's the most loving thing God can do. So how might God be actively pruning you behind the scenes? And I want you to think about that because this in many ways implies that there is pain to come. There is hardship and there is suffering, but at the hands of God, they are always repurposed for his glory. Number three, bear fruit, bearing witness to love. So what does Jesus actually mean when he says bearing fruit? Well, maybe to state the obvious, bearing fruit is just the result of living a life in union with God. And, um, but, I, but in our minds, we are often very quick to move to just the external proof of that, our behavior. But I believe it goes just one step further. It's not just, do I do the right things? It's, but do I want the right things? If our wants and longings and desires are at the core of our identity, the wellspring from which all our actions and behaviors flow, Proverbs 4.23, then true fruit must prove itself in the internal work of our desire. The fruit in our life must be internal as much as it is external. It's sort of the difference between what I'm talking about and legalism. What we bear witness to is the transformation Jesus is doing at the very depths of our being. But Jesus always reminds us that the spiritual life is never meant to just be centered on self, but always directed toward the other. Verse 8 says that when we bear much fruit, we prove that we are disciples to the world and so glorify the Father. Bearing fruit is a missional witness to the world. We're not meant to just bear fruit simply to enjoy our spiritual progress, but to pour out the abundance of love emanating from God's very being. Your greatest value to a world without Jesus is the witness of your life and how your life embodies love in the ordinary. So what is the fruit you want to bear in your life and in the life of others? 
Now I want to make this practical. What does this look like? How do I do this? Well, the early giants of our faith would often categorize the disciplines in these two ways. Crafting a rule of life is considering how your daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly rhythms feed the contemplative life and the active life, much like the monastic, monastic monks. And uh, I'm going to show uh, this picture, and what I would um, recommend to you is to take out your phone, take a picture of this to look at it later on. But here's my challenge for you as a first step. Consider what it might look like to structure your life around a rule, a trellis, to feed both the contemplative life, which is your life with God, and the active life, how you love others. Uh, and these quadrants, you can see that this is laid out as quadrants, and those are listing practices of abstinence and engagement, and also practices that we do alone and with community. But my challenge for you is to start where you are at, not where you want to be, but where you are at. If it's two practices, if it's four, if it's just one, one dedicated practice. But I want you to consider throughout your life, what would it look like to slowly replace deformative habits toward practices that attune you to the divine and to each other? Practices that guide your daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly rhythms. A container and structure of formative practices that are intentionally tuning your heart towards your deepest desire. And as I close, I want to illustrate this, the impact of how having intentionality with our spirituality can have drastic influence and effect even to our future generations. Many of you know that both of my parents are immigrants. My mom is from Mexico and my dad is from Honduras. And one of the unique things, uh, perspectives of a second generation immigrant child like myself is seeing the gap of opportunity uh, that you receive compared to your parents. You're often confronted with the privileges you receive because of your parents' sacrifice. And one of those is education. You see a picture here of my dad and I at my first graduation. And then you'll see another picture of me speaking at a graduation last year here at RTI. Uh, you could tell I grew up a little bit with a mustache. My face is still the same and my hairline's receding, but. Now, as a child, I would often see, wake up in the morning and see my dad with just little to no education teach himself to read God's word. This was his rule of life, to be immersed in God's word and in prayer. And I would watch him day and night. And growing up, I saw the fruit of this um, in all the church gatherings that would happen at our house on weekends, the hospitality he showed strangers, and even praying for all the angsty teens at the venue my brother and I would play shows at with our bands. And one of my dad's big dreams was to go to school and to learn more about the Bible. And unfortunately, this was just not in the cards for his life due to where he was and the lack of opportunity. But yet, it never dawns on me it never dawns on me the irony and beauty of how God works. You see, on, on some level, his son, me, I embody what my dad couldn't do. I am doing. And because of his rule of life and the fruits of its labor, I get to teach God's word. I got to go to school. And I just, little did I know that just every morning that I would wake up and see my dad teach himself to read. That it was in fact forming who I was becoming and informing my own future. 
and me as a person. And the reason I love that is, and I love my dad, because he's just an ordinary man, not given a lot, not offered a lot by the world. But he lived a life centered on Jesus, which had rippling effects to me as a child. And I also recognize that everything that I do as a pastor, as a preacher, and as a professor is an extension of his fruit, of his labor. And so what I want to show to you is that your life matters, how you live your life matters, and how you structure your life matters, not just to you, but to people in your influence. And so, what is it gonna take to become like Jesus? Intentional spirituality that takes all of you. Let me pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, invade this space with your love. Thank you that you provide us with a vision and a future of a life to live in the spirit. Thank you that even in this chaotic world that is trying to write our story, you are working to write our story and providing the ways to get there. Would you help us as people see you constantly in the day, daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly? Thank you, Lord. In these things we pray. Amen. Amen.